you for coming for the uh, penultimate presentation in this year's Health Law Seminar Series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Tina Piper. <laughs> professor Piper is an Associate Professor at McGill University's Faculty of Law. She holds Master's and Doctoral degrees from the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar an LLB from here at Dalhousie, where she won the gold medal in her class, as well as engineering an engineering undergraduate degree from U of T. While at Dal Law, she also worked at the Legal Aid Clinic, was involved with the Dalhousie Association of Women in the Law, edited the Dalhousie Journal of Legal Studies, and various other pursuits. After graduating from Dal, um, she later clerked for Chief Justice McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada. Since arriving at McGill in 2009, Tina has, amongst other things, served as the research director at McGill's Center for Intellectual Property Policy and was a resident fellow quite recently at McGill's Institute for Public Life for the Arts and Ideas, a collaboration of seven faculties and McGill's libraries that seeks to, quote, foster dialogue amongst disciplines at, at, and the, within the university and the organizations outside of it. And it's in that institute's aim, as well as the title of Tina's talk today, Patenting Outside the Law in Canadian Medical History, where I think we can find a, a hint of what's so compelling and maybe even subversive about Tina's work. It's genuinely interdisciplinary. Her interest in what's outside the law, her prioritization of the perspectives of others, those on the outside, it's for this reason that I think we're lucky to be inside on this day, talking with Tina. In her 2014 book published by Oxford University Press, Putting Intellectual Property in Its Place, Tina and her two co-authors put their agenda this way. We contend that in seeking a full understanding of what intellectual property is, statutes and cases are the last thing we should look at, not the first. What blasphemy in the of the law school, right? <laughs> Imagine that, a commitment to talking to people, to actors, to communities first, as opposed to the musings of courts and legislatures. Mm -hmm. That commitment, giving primacy to people, not the law and the books, carries through all of Tina's work, and it has the potential to turn a lawyer's typical understanding of the world on its head. Again, quoting from that 2014 book, the case studies that she and her collaborators have developed suggest that the effects attributed to intellectual property statute and case law are often, in fact, results of cultural, professional, economic, and ideological circumstances in which intellectual property law is invoked or imagined, not the other way around. <coughs> Tina's scholarship is, in short, a powerful call to be more humanist in our understanding of the law, its many sources and influences and an important call, I think, to students, lawyers, and legal scholars alike. I'm very much looking forward to her presentation today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tina Piper. Thank you so much, Matt, oh, okay. uh, for, that, for that warm introduction I've, I've known known Matt for several years. We've had the good fortune to collaborate on a couple of projects and, uh, and I've, I've, actually, uh, I've actually drawn a lot of inspiration from his own sort of humanist understanding of, of, of the law um, and, and that's helped to inform uh, the way I think about some of these questions. Um, particularly what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, first I wanted to thank the Health Law Institute for inviting me um, I always love an opportunity to come back to Halifax. My family lives here, and uh, I get a chance to wear my Nova Scotia pin on my lapel. <laughs> <laughs> or I could wear that in Montreal as well, but you know, um, it, people people recognize it. Um, so, what I wanted to, uh, the what I decided to do for the talk today um, was to do a bit of a. a, a a synthesis of several research projects that I've been working on over probably the course of a decade, um, starting with my doctorate um, and ending with some current research uh, that I've been doing into the archives, um, the archival sources of the uh, National Research Council in Ottawa. And the underlying theme or thread of this story is 
Um, how, how do we uh, reconcile differing normative orders? So how, in, in, uh, in, in intellectual property law in particular, how, how do we take individuals who may have different commitments? So they may have commitments, uh, professional commitments, personal commitments, um, ideological commitments, however you choose to characterize these. How do you take us in all of our messiness and, um, and understand us as actors, as actors who, in a sense, end up uh, creating law, creating rules as we go through the world. And so my approach is, uh, what I'd say is, is largely biographical. Um, and I've come to this in the hard way. Um, I started looking at institutions and I got kind of overwhelmed by all the policy papers and the institutions and all the different ways that institutions spoke and often didn't speak in a coherent voice. So I had trouble understanding what the institution was trying to say um, and what the institution meant. And then institutions often um, contradict themselves over time, as do people. So I'm not trying to say that people are um, easy to understand. Um, and so then I moved sort of from the institutional level um, uh, to looking at people within institutions and trying to understand um, how major actors within institutions, major individuals, um, sort of pivotal moments, uh, influence the shape of the rules and norms that influenced uh, certain, certain features. So that's, um, so that's my approach. Uh, th uh, Professor Rod McDonald, who recently <coughs> passed away at McGill, was a sort of a, an exponent of this kind of approach of the sort of the, the individual as a self-constituting normative order, like as the individual creating laws as they go through the world and, and encountering different legal regimes. And I think in some way my work is, um, sort of draws from that, that influence. Um, and what, I, what I've been interested in, in general, has been the issue of medical patenting. Um, in, in a very contemporary way, I've been interested in how, um, in how complicated this issue is. How, um, how fraught it is. So any time that we talk about uh, sequencing the human genome or we talk about uh, uh, creating new vaccines for, uh, for infectious diseases um, or if we're talking about, um, in a sense, creating some sort of useful medical innovation, um, the conversation gets really complicated really quickly. Um, and there are a number of contemporary ways that, um, that these disputes are resolved. So. Um, there are all sorts of interesting strategies out there for trying to create collaboration or trying to break down some of the property-like barriers um, when, um, when trying to engage in innovation in the medical field. Um, so these include things like, for example, patent pools or um, uh, creating uh, commons, so donating research or um, creating uh, property-less places for, for collaboration to occur. And so I spent a, a bit of time looking at that, and I was, I was sort of interested in, in how these, these issues were so complicated. Complicated because medicine invokes, I think, it's, it's sort of ground zero for patent conflicts because it really invokes this, this concern about access and this concern that, you know, um, if, uh, if somebody gets a hold of this, this particular innovation, we might not be able to treat people or cure people or save lives. And it's really that sort of saving lives um, public interest kind of link that I think really drives a lot of the controversy about uh, patenting in the medical field. And I speak very generally, um, and I've tried to make my work more specific by looking at a few examples, so I'll, I'll bring it down. I haven't even started my slides yet. This is by way of sort of very long situating it. <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to give you the sense, the sort of like, why does it matter kind of discussion right off the bat so that you understand, so that you can understand why it matters to me that I'm doing this research. Um, and where I came from in thinking about it, I came from a very, um, a very rooted place in, in terms of thinking about how we use intellectual property rights creatively through non-exclusive licensing or um, creating patent pools or collaboration agreements. Um, I was thinking about that and where that came from and how do we make that better and how, how do we bring people to the table to, to engage in this kind of collaboration. Um, and so what, I, what I've done here is I've, I've extracted what I call some of the arguments um, that surround medical patenting. Um, and so on, I've, I've got sort of the for category and the, and the against medical patenting. And so, um, you know, just to sort of cherry pick some of them, you know, there's a concern that research becomes profit but not curiosity oriented. 
Um, but if you patent, it protects inventions from getting into the wrong hands. Um, it can promote a culture, pre patents can promote this culture of secrecy while you're trying to keep things quiet to preserve the novelty. But in fact, some people argue that when you publish a patent, it's like publishing, it's, it's, it's a real publication. It doesn't just sit in the patent office. So it, the specification is a form of publication. Um, there's some arguments that pats, patents or the sort of undue venal kind of uh, quest for patents chills research, but others um, claim that it actually keeps researchers in universities and other public research institutions by creating uh, rewards that might allow them to benefit more than just their salary. Um, so these are some of the arguments. What's interesting for me about these arguments is that these are drawn from documents from the early 1900s. Um, they're not contemporary arguments, but I think most of these arguments I have heard, I, you know, if I picked up, if I, if I Googled something, um, about sort of access to medicines. You could probably find many of these same arguments around, in particular, university patenting um, of, of important, or shall we call them, life-saving inventions. Um, and so the arguments haven't really changed. There seems to be something quite um, fundamental about the nature of the patent system and the nature of university research um, that kind of, um, that persists. Uh, what I've been interested in is thinking about um, where, where in, so what kind of, what kind of allowances have we created for medical innovation within the patent system, and why have those arisen? And once those have arisen, um, how have they been instantiated? And what, what a, where I, where I came most. Where I became most interested in was thinking about the um, the medical exception from the medical methods exception from patentability. So this was an exception. This is an exception that is part of the, for example, European Patent Convention. Um, it's part of Canadian common law. So it's an exception that, and I've got the formulation here. Um, it excludes from patentability methods for treatment of the human or animal body by surgery or therapy and diagnostic methods that are practiced on the human or animal body shall not be regarded as inventions which are susceptible of industrial ac application, and it doesn't apply to products. So what's interesting about this provision is that it really seems to take um, the issue of medical, of, of medical innovations and situates it quite centrally in its terms. Um, unlike many other provisions of the Patent Act, which don't really address um, uh, those types of innovations, but when you actually look at the provision, it doesn't do much of anything. So it excludes from its terms most of what you might be interested in patenting. So on the one hand, it seems to sort of create a carve out for medical innovation, but on the other hand, it, it takes away by its own limitations. Um, and in Canada, we don't even have the diagnostic methods exception, really. So it's even more narrow than this. And part of what I'm highlighting to you as well here is to the extent, the extent to which many of these norms are Anglo-American. Um, so there are similar norms and principles that float through the United States, Canada, and England um, that uh, shared principles of common law um, that, that have influenced the sort of the shape of patent law. Um, what's interesting to me about this exclusion and about what we currently have within the law for um, creating, carving out a special space for, for, for medical patenting, if we call it, if we give it a shorthand, is that it only covers um, things that are practiced on the human or animal body. So it wouldn't apply, there's a sort of classic example is an allergy test applied to your skin wouldn't be patentable, but an allergy test that took a sample away from your skin would be patentable. Um, so some of the distinctions seem a little unclear why, it doesn't seem to be a principled distinction between some of these, uh, why things are patentable or not. Um, there, uh, another interesting part of this provision is that the invention shall not be regarded, that the particular subject matter won't be regarded as an invention, an invention which is susceptible, susceptible of industrial application. Now that's really interesting to me because the, and you'll see as I take you through the story, the, the core problem is that there's something about medical work that isn't industrial, that wants to situate itself outside of the market and, in, uh, and industrial application. And that's what this provision seeks to do. It doesn't say they're not patentable because 
it's unethical or because they're not conveniently patentable or that sort of thing. It's, it's spe specifically because they lack industrial, ap apl an, an industrial application. Um, and another interesting thing about this provision is that it doesn't apply to products. So it doesn't apply to medicines. Um, medicines have their own kind of whole, um, their whole, their own realm within the sort of the patent regime. And that's developed over time. But I was very confused when I first came to this field. I thought, well, shouldn't this obviously cover medicines, pharmaceuticals? Sorry, I'm using the, 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 the 20th century, the 19th century term medicines. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't they really, shouldn't a provision that seeks to exclude from patentability something is not um, industrially applicable and that, you know, has as its purpose of, uh, well, as I will show you, um, the justification at the European level for this exception. And these are mirrored in Canada. I mean, I state this, I use the European example because it's so clear in Canada. It's more of a hodgepodge of, of common law results, but um, the judges really have been speaking to each other over time to, cre to craft a, a similar norm. And it's, it's even more interesting in the United States. Um, but it says patents will not hamper doctors' valuable life-saving work. And that's where the medical exception seeks to intervene. It doesn't want doctors um, in the course of perhaps a surgery to feel like they can't make a certain kind of incision or um, do a particular technique because of a patent stopping them. Um, and so that's the ostensible justification for the provision and, and its very narrow scope. And medicines and pharmaceuticals have been taken up by whole other parts of the Patent Act um, and have their own uh, sort of complicated regime and they're very clearly um, uh, patentable and, and meet the sort of requirements of industrial application, novelty, and inventiveness, and so forth. So I trace the roots of this provision and its exception to try and understand a bit about the history of medical patenting and some of, and the way that these arguments have been resolved legislatively, but also, as Matt said, outside the law. <laughs> so trying to understand where, um, where, these, where the solutions have come from, because what, um, what troubled me about this exception was its bizarre scope and also its limited applicability. It seemed to me vestigial. It seemed to me something that was left in the law that one, at one time did something, and now we're not really sure what it does, but it's still there because it's, harder, it's hard to get things off the books once they're, in, once they're written down, basically. It's hard, it's, it is hard once there's a consensus around certain provisions to get rid of them. Um, it's just the way the world works, I guess. So I was curious what, what understanding that provision might have to say about, um, about medical patenting. Um, and I traced the roots of that provision, and this is a very long story. Um, so I'm, I'm really giving you the Coles Notes summary here. Um, so apologies to anyone who's a student of medical, um, of medical history um, or science studies who, who has, you know, is, is involved in a, you know, very small five-year period um, that I'm skimming over vastly. But essentially um, what I found, and this was, um, this was the work I did for my, my doctorate, was that in the United Kingdom by the mid-1800s, um, there was a two-tier medical practice um, and that medicine was unsafe and of li limited ef effectiveness, and so there was a concern that um, that there were um, sort of uh, high high class physicians and and a vast mass of low um, low paid, um, largely not terribly consistently educated um, practitioners who were basically um, who it was unclear in many cases whether they were they were doing. Uh, whether, were, whether they were in fact improving people's health. Um, they were intervening in, in, in health moments, but it was unclear whether um, they were effective. Um, and they used a great number of pat a great number and variety of patent medicines. Um, and the interesting thing about patent medicines is the use of the word patent medicines. Um, so these were often patented, but they didn't need to be patented. Um, but the patent was seen to grant a measure of um, of, 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 of validity or um, it ser served as a type of accreditation before proper regulatory regimes were in place um, to, um, to test the sort of efficacy of, of medicines. Um, and um, by, 
the seven, late 1700s, patent medicines were the single, uh, by usually what they called nostrum makers, so, but you know, the, the people who made the, um, the, the patent medicines were the single, single largest occupational use of the patent system. Um, and so when you go back in the documents in the, in the archives, actually in, in the UK um, where I was working on this, it's, it's really fascinating to see the extent to which the question of patent medicines and the income, because this is always the fraught issue, is that patent, um, patent regimes are interested in increasing patent applications. So the patent office is called the patent office, not the no patent office. It's the, <laughs> they, they want people to patent, and so there's a real incentive um, with uh, if you have a single largest document, <laughs> if you have a group of people who so frequently use the patent system, it's in, your, it's in your interest to encourage them, not to discourage them by making the system more amenable to this kind of activity. So it wasn't that, um, that, that, that the lawyers were, were impeding anyone from getting, um, from getting patents over their medicines. It was the um, newly conscious and uh, starting to professionalize medical um, core who wanted to regularize their practice and improve their reputation um, in aid of in aid of um, in aid of professionalizing and and improving the condition of physicians and I don't want to be too determinative about the links between uh, between medical professionalization and and the rules that resulted um, what was interesting was that there was this phenomenon of, of professionalization um, and that, uh, that there was this phenomenon of, of professionalization and, then, um, and that as part of that project of professionalization, physicians sought to gain more control over the work that they did. Um, and gaining control over the work they did meant um, controlling their pr practitioners. Uh, sort of like what the law society does with, with lawyers and sort of reining in some of the some of the more um, some of the some of the more marginal elements, bringing them in, leaving them out, creating standards, um, that's that sort of thing. And so what I found was that the medical exception was an artifact of that tension of that of that um, the medical methods exception arose as a sort of artifact of that tension between professionalization and the desire to um, to eliminate or control patent medicines and um, for lawyers, if for physicians to gain control of their, of their work so they could, um, so, so that they could in fact per perhaps make people feel better. Um, so this, the, the journals were a, a primary source for me of debates and I know you have to, what I found was that you actually have to read the journals two ways, like the journals themselves had uh, a substantial interest in professionalization, um, but they and they also played this role of um, of sort of um, broadcasting what I think were aspirational norms, perhaps not actual norms. So it's interesting, just as from I think if you're doing uh, primary source work in law and you're trying to understand what are the sources outside the law where you can where you can find norms. Like if you're looking for <coughs> rules outside the law. This is always the question in the work that I do. Like if you're talking to people and the people are dead um, and long time ago, um, how do you understand, um, you don't have that primary source. You have to go to the documents and then how do you read the documents in a way that's accurate to the intent of the documents? And so that's what I spent some time trying to understand is you know, when the Lancet says something, is the Lancet reflecting the rule of the profession or is the Lancet reflecting what it would like doctors to be doing? Is it trying to set up a sort of aspirational um, a sort of an aspirational ideal. And I think what I've concluded is that it is, it is a bit aspirational. It, it was quite aspirational and perhaps the practice of physicians was much murkier and messier than what was presented in the journals. Um, uh, and the journals liked, my impression from the journals was that there was sort of like the reasonable doctor, the, the sort of reasonable well-behaved doctor that we would all hope to be and they would sort of speak to that reasonable, well-behaved doctor that we should all try to be um, and, and try and reflect that. So 
here was a sort of classic quotation from, uh, from a leading article from 1851. Um, the remarkable point is that the judges and Mr. Bethel and the Solicitor General argued the case precisely as though Morrison's pills had been a discovery such as the steam engine or spinning jenny, perfectly at liberty to claim the law respecting patented ar articles of manufacture instead of a nostrum, which may have sent thousands to premature graves. So this really highlighted the concerns around patent medicines um, and the extent to which they were regarded as dangerous, um, that they actually killed people, um, but also the extent to which um, many felt that they shouldn't be patented, they shouldn't be given, they shouldn't be treated as inventions, um, legitimate inventions instead of quack, quack medicine or quack products um, that, should be, um, that should be ignored or, or discarded. So there was this tension between um, the legal profession and the medical profession in, in doing this. Um, so professionalization, and this again is a bird's eye view of, of what, um, what, I, what I observed um, and how I, try, uh, how I put the pieces together was that professionalization within medicine happened by um, distancing the sort of nuts and bolts of medical practice from, um, from the market um, and, and creating a sort of, um, creating the publics and the public interest that would justify um, the, the practice of medicine. Uh, in that public interest um, by excluding regulation by other professions and in this case law was a key profession that medicine sought to sort of extricate itself um, from, from beneath, um, gaining state support for self-regulation, standardizing and controlling the quality of the medical commodity. In this case the patent medicines were the primary medical commodity. Um, the goal was to um, was to, to get away from those unstandardized um, chaotic um, nostrums and creating a sense of collegiality or esprit de corps um, and lawyers again played an important role in as it, the journals observed and again I quote from the Lancet that there's nothing more lamentable and nothing more reprehensible than unseemly quarrels among medical practitioners within the courts was essentially they were commenting on cases um, in which uh, physicians uh, medical practitioners were arguing amongst themselves about various patent medicines in which they had a financial stake um, and they were allowing these disputes to be resolved by the courts instead of sort of closing ranks within the medical profession and allowing the profession to, uh, in a sense, self-regulate. So, so this sort of outside the law component of this was that in, so given that the law, the, the law was, was not exactly aligned with the interests of um, of, of the folks who wanted to uh, create a more um, professional practice of medicine. And so the British Medical Association, which was sort of the primary, I guess, trade union of, the, of, of, uh, of physicians at the time in the UK, uh, came up with this resolution um, in 1903 um, that was passed. And there's, I don't have many details about the sort of circumstances in which it was passed, um, the sort of number of votes. I, I, can see, I went to the British Medical uh, Association's archives and, um, and looked through their documents and found the original sort of statements, but I didn't find, I mean, I think they were, pa it was passed with the, whatever was required, a majority or a unanimity. Um, but the, essentially the resolution provided that it is ethically undesirable for a medical man who has invented a device intended for medical purposes to take out a patent for the purpose of deriving from such patent the financial results of a monopoly. So this was trying to rein in the sort of patent medicine, the link between medical practice and the patent medicines. Um, it was interesting that it said it's ethically undesirable, right? So it wasn't legally, it wasn't illegal, it was ethically undesirable. So it's a soft, it's a soft norm, I guess we'd call it. But again, I think it was quite aspirational because you see subsequent to the passage of this resolution and its publication in the British Medical Journal, you see in the pages of the British Medical Journal a real effort to kind of elaborate, well, what does this norm mean in these particular circumstances? So this was really interesting to me as another sort of outside the law moment, really, like this moment where the journal through sort of letters to the editor was trying to explain to the members of the profession what this resolution meant. And some worried people, but not too worried because I guess it was an ethically undesirable practice, but not a but not a, an illegal practice. Um, and so I don't know if these letters were from real people or if they were the editors of the British Medical Journal standing in as real 
people, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Again, there's a lot of ambiguity in some of this, and I don't want to read it too close to the letter, if you see what I mean. Like, I, I try to read it like, well, you know, they, they, they give the person an acronym, X, or a, a pseudonym, sorry. <laughs> X-rays asks whether it is legal for a medical man to register an article he has invented, and we presume to derive profit from its sale. In reply, we may express the opinion that no medical practitioner should be interested in the sale of anything which may be his professional duty to recommend to his patients. So there's this real concern that, um, you, that the conflicts of interest presented by those who, and it was really the concern was about um, was about uh, uh, medicine was about the patent medicines, but extended to things like devices. Devices were a big question. How to what extent were devices? Um, uh, sort of uh, instruments. To what extent were devices and instruments encompassed by this? And, and opinion went both ways. Um, so what I've argued or concluded or, um, yeah, what, what, I've, what I've found had emerged was that by the sort of early 1900s, the medical profession had developed an informal normative order, a sort of parallel patent system um, that um, evaluated inventions as to their merit internally. So physicians would, through practice or through, um, through conferences and speeches and publication, uh, determine which inventions were meritorious and, 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 and the reward for such was perhaps a prof professional income, but it was also perhaps regard from your, from your peers. Um, the disclosure and dissemination functions happen through the sort of the organs of this sort of newly organized and formal profession. Um, and enforcement, well, you know, I never, I, I looked, I went through the British Medical Association's um, disciplinary hearings up until the 1960s, looking for instances where this resolution might have been enforced in any way, shape, or form, and I found nothing. So it never made it into a sort of formal disciplinary process. I think this was all within the realm of sort of shaming and shunning and gossip, really. Um, which are very effective <laughs> in a closed community. Um, and the interesting part of the story that I will not tell you about today at all, but just sort of FYI, is that you know the common law established a formal, in the UK, um, established a, f a formal common law prescription against medical methods of, um, of patenting medical methods in, the 19, uh, in 1914. Um, the, the graph should really go a bit earlier to 1903 when the sort of informal norm is first like expressed or articulated. Um, and then um, the, the informal norm basically was, ta was taken off the books by formal resolution in 1951. So we do have a sort of beginning and an end. It doesn't exist as a formal ethical prohibition within the medical profession. But that was because around that time started negotiating the European, uh, well, European Patent Convention was effectively the moment when a variety of nations brought into, um, brought into being a formal medical methods exception into their um, patent law because a lot of countries actually had this norm and this, this prohibition or norm or it, it varied in different, and in particular the Catholic countries, so a country like Italy had a big prohibition against patenting medical methods or pa getting patents involved in medicine and this was, goes to the core of the European patent um, negotiations. Um, there was this concern that um, it was very interesting that that every country basically, I think except Germany, had some sort of prohibition on medical patenting, um, but that countries were countries really differed on the intensity of that prohibition and what and how it should be formulated and to what it should apply. Should it apply to all medicines? Should it just apply to medical methods? And so a lot of the debate happened around that. And essentially, as the, um, as the formal norm through the common law gained strength, both through expression in case law and through statute, the informal norm dropped off in, um, in sort of its expression. It's unclear. I'd have to do more research to determine the extent to which it was enforced informally. Um, and I sort of chart its decline by saying it was very strong in the 1960s, and then case law really hollowed out the, um, the legislative uh, norm against um, patentability. And again, all of this applies in Canada pretty much, um, I mean, with some nuance, but it's, um, it was a norm, and, and within the United States. I use the UK as sort of the ground zero example because it was so stark and it, it really did originate there. And what I found from studying 
um, through the archival sources was that um, the medical practitioners, researchers um, in the three countries, Canada, the US, and the UK, really had a lot of collaborations and discussions. Um, sort of, um, anytime something was afoot that was possibly a bit con controversial, Canada would send an emissary to the Medical Research Council in the UK to find out what they thought about it and then sort of report back to see if it would offend anyone. Um, and I found in general, in many instances, that the Canadian Medical Association sort of replicated or reflected some of the, state, the, the, the positions of the British Medical Association. So there's a very close, in a sense, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't study these medical associations, so I'm not certain how much you can say that they sort of modeled themselves off the UK. But it, it really appears in many instances that in some of these big policy issues where the UK had experience, there was a, there was a degree of modeling. Um, so, what I was interested in, I was always interested in Canada as a sort of middle power, um, sitting between the sort of um, the more uh, formal, careful, cautious UK culture, um, a culture that a legal culture, in fact, that was quite often quite elite, elitist. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> that often sought to preserve power or social division in a way, um, and the U.S. culture, which really put a lot of the work into the market um, and allowed things to just sort themselves out. Um, Canada sort of sat somewhere in the middle. It was too close to the US to ignore it. Its patent system is basically, in many cases, uh, a way of, of, of bringing US um, innovations into the country and uh, providing that <laughs> stamp of exclusivity to allow them to be marketed in Canada. So um, much too close to be ignored. Uh, the UK seemed to have a much more sort of inspirational influence on Canadian practice. So I was interested in Canada as a middle power because what I had found, and this is what the, the rest of the talk is about, is a number of sort of interesting Canadian examples where we charted a middle path through this mess where, um, where the demands, the, the controversies, the, 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 the challenges of medical patenting were avoided by sort of, by deft maneuvers that, um, that didn't, that sat, and, and this is where the outside the law bit becomes a bit murky. It wasn't, um, it wasn't that Canadian researchers didn't patent, but it was often that they used different mechanisms to affect the same ends and didn't use the obvious legal mechanism as you'd expect it to be used and relied on more informal networks to kind of affect the ends that they sought to achieve. So it was a, it's a very interesting model and it, it speaks to what I think is an interesting way in which Canadian, um, well, it's, this is the contemporary discussion that's going on, is the extent to which Canadian technology transfer offices need to or could be more ambitious in the ways that they, <laughs> uh, in the ways that they uh, uh, encourage commercialization of inventions. And what I found in a lot of my research was that Canadian technology, the nascent Canadian technology transfer organizations were actually extremely adventurous. And they were adventurous sort of out of necessity um, and out of inspiration. It was, it was, it's, it's interesting to me that, um, that, that we, that, that Canada actually, that Canadian researchers, and it's hard to speak of Canada, but because what I'm really talking about are people. And there were a few people who did some interesting things. And so one of them was uh, James Bertram Collip. And I wrote a paper that I circulated to some of the people who or I guess had to read something in advance of this seminar, uh, this, this speech, uh, this talk. Um, but James Bertram Collip was, and again, this is in brief, he was a researcher who um, had been involved in uh, the sort of the discovery um, of insulin, or really it's sort of, um, it's sort of making it usable, um, but hadn't been part of the Nobel Prize winning part of it, but was part of the patent. Um, and he, he's, a su he's a really interesting character. If you're looking at technology transfer in the medical profession, uh, in, in, medical, in the medical research area in, um, in early 20th century uh, Canada, um, in part because he moved quite a bit. He moved between the University of Toronto, University of Alberta, um, McGill, then I believe to McMaster. Um, so he had many different labs in many different institutions and he brought this experience with him to the various different um, institutions and he was constantly discovering new and interesting things. And he was constantly, and, and I guess you have to kind of picture the way the world was back then and again I'm going to sort of like 
give you the bird's eye view. I mean, you read a lot of these accounts of what a university was like, and it was like dirt floors, and there might be farm animals inside some of the buildings, and research facilities were, were crude and approximate. And so it's not the sort of modern research institution that we imagine gleaming white donor names and such. Well, I mean, they probably had donor names like back then. I don't know. Um, but it was, it was less formal, a bit more chaotic. Um, and people had a considerable latitude, if they had ideas or approaches, to kind of adopt what worked for them. Um, and they kind of had to find their own research resources a bit themselves. They were also allowed to inhabit multiple identities, which I find interesting. And Matt really does that with his sort of dual medicine law identity. Um, but in, you know, we're sort of going through this moment, I think, where that's becoming um, more more, nor more normal or more, more common is to have multiple identities. It was very common back then for someone to be a physician, to be uh, uh, a researcher, to be a university professor, to, um, to, have to be a businessman, to speculate on the side, and as well to perhaps um, serve in the military, because that's where I'm going to end all this. Um, because I think that the military actually has a lot to say about the way that um, technology transfer of medical innovation developed in Canada. Um, and so looking at what James Bertram Collip did, he, he invented some interesting things in this environment where there weren't a lot of rules and he um, had these multiple commitments to different identities, right? He had a commitment as a physician to, um, to, to what I showed you before, like some of the um, ke keeping away from lawyers, <laughs> not profiting, not getting into conflict of interest situations. He had a commitment as a university researcher, and I don't deal with this, but it, it's a significant normative commitment to um, the shorthand kudos. And again, like I know people dispute whether kudos really is a valid way of characterizing this, but some sort of version of communalism, universalism, organized skepticism, disinterestedness. So the typical university researcher um, working in a public interest, working, um, working uh, with share, sharing results, um, working in the spirit of science, these sorts of things. So he had that kind of commitment. Um, and he's, he, did, he served in, um, in the First World War. Um, he, uh, so there were, there were commitments. He, he also, he, he, he was a man who liked to live comfortably. Um, and so he wasn't averse to making money. And I don't think, um, my sense from the documentation as well is that the university researchers didn't make a lot of money back then. And so it was more okay for people to kind of supplement on the side and kind of make, pull together um, what they could from various different sources. So there were various models floating around um, as science became more organized. So this is another moment that's happening, and it's a big moment, right? The, the sort of birth of laboratory organized science, a lot of it flowing from, uh, from Germany. Um, the birth of corporations with R&D departments, um, the birth of, um, and again, this is all happening at different times in different ways, and so this is kind of in the air, right? There's, um, there's a sense that you, could, you can come up with things that are actually really important, you know, anti-malarials and vaccines, and um, you, can, you can come up with medical innovations that actually more help people than harm them, and that was kind of a big moment too, right? Um, and you could do that through structured investigation and, and these sorts of things. So there were various models and ways that people were thinking about doing this in a way that didn't harm some of their, their normative commitments. And I think it was a world that was also a bit, I mean, look, the past of a foreign country and that sort of thing. So it was a world that was different. There were fewer people. Um, there were fewer people doing this kind of research. People tended to know each other quite well. These were communities of familiars, very familiars, um, even though they might not, they couldn't travel as much. They were they were distant, but they, um, they there were all these sort of characteristics of research at the time that kind of um, I don't know how it played into this model, but through the documents, I get this real sense that people wanted to do good. They didn't want to. They didn't want to. I don't know, uh, jettison or harm their professional contacts, their networks. The, it's a very personal set of networks um, through doing the wrong thing or appearing too concerned with money or appearing too um, preoccupied with commercialization. And so there are all these models that came up to kind of try and negotiate that. And it's interesting because many of these models are actually I almost identical to ones that are that make the rounds every time there's a debate about how to collaborate to develop a new vaccine or to um, provide access to essential medicines. So one, I'll just 
go through, there, and there were examples in institutions that various um, STS scholars have, have dealt with in a great deal of depth. So this is just sort of a, a list. Um, there were independent nonprofit foundations that could manage patents. Um, then there was basically the same thing, an independent nonprofit foundation that would manage it for only one university. So there was envisioned like you might have a central organization to do this, or you could have one associated with a particular institution. And this is sort of starting to look like a technology transfer organization. Um, there was this idea of having a special patent managing committee within an institution. This was the insulin model. Um, and there was this idea that the scientist could don dedicate their rights to the public, the so-called patent dedication. And it's interesting because patent de dedication gets a lot of airtime. I feel like patent dedication is something that got a lot of airtime in the early 1900s and it gets almost no airtime today. And I think it's because people have realized that if you come up with something important and you just dedicate it to the public, it's going to get snapped up pretty quickly by someone who's going to do something with it that you don't want them to do with it because you probably, there probably is something you don't want them to do with it if you've kind of made this dedication. <laughs> like you're probably not dedicating it totally selflessly. Um, you're probably dedicating it because you want some sort of good to come of it. Um, and that doesn't usually, doesn't often happen when you just kind of leave it out in the air. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and then the no patent solution, um, which was just similar to the patent dedication option um, and has a similar sort of reception. People, yeah, anyways. So these were the various models in the air at the time and, and J.B. Collip came up with, um, and so in discussions with McGill and trying to, he, he had invented, um, uh, uh, he had formulated um, uh, an estrogen treatment that is now Premarin, which is currently prescribed to women, pr generally postmenopausal, um, in, in, with great frequency. Um, at the time it was called Aminin. Um, he had also um, formulated this parathi parathyroid hormone. Um, his solution, and again, he was sitting sort of at the, in the center of all of these sort of conflicting, I don't know, conflicting or perhaps totally reconcilable um, commitments. Um, specifically, the documents that, that I went through found, you know, we found that the McGill, when they were trying to decide what to do with Eminem, they sent an emissary, the dean, to, um, to the Medical Research Council, the British Medical Research Council, um, to discuss what they should be doing with Collip's, um, with Collip's discoveries. And the British MRC said that they deplored the issuance of patents by universities as a bad principle for academic institutions. Um, and then McGill said, well, I doubt it if it is wise for McGill to issue a patent. And we just, it's interesting they use the language of issuing a patent as well because it sort of it suggests that like McGill is issuing the patent, but the office is issuing the patent to McGill. Um, and we would certainly have a better academic standing among our British colleagues if we refrained. Um, and that was the position that, and you see within the documents that that was the position that McGill actually adopted was a no patent position. So they, they didn't, the approach was not to get a patent over Eminem, but was in fact to trademark the name Eminem with links to Collips and the university's good names. So McGill's crest would be beside the Eminem um, logo. And then exclusive rights to formulate um, and test the quality. Uh, to exclusive rights to formulate were given to various pharmaceutical companies with testing rights held back by the inventor in a way of, of um, controlling the quality. And this was possible because in this world that existed back then, um, there weren't a lot of places to do this kind of testing and there weren't a lot of people who would have been experienced enough to um, produce it in this kind, to, to control the quality of this substance. So it made sense. I don't know how much you can take from this discussion to the present, but it was an interesting example of sort of sitting within the law but outside it as well at the same time. Um, the, the next part of the story that, and this is the part that I'm sort of, that I'm working on right now, um, and that, that interests me, um, is the extent to which, and this, this was a theme that I noticed running through all the medical patenting literature, was the extent to which the wars, um, World War I and World War II, um, as we move into the sort of um, 1920s, 30s, 40s era, um, and the shape of the norm, the extent to which war and its exigencies really shaped um, medical patenting. Um, the war 
And if you look at the MRC documents, medical, the UK Medical Research Council documents, I think the turning point for them in their position on patenting, um, they had taken a strict no patents position for a very long time. And then once they observed what was happening during the war in terms of actually getting people to produce um, substances in the quantity and quality that they needed to administer to them to, to, to their troops, they found it very difficult to do without patents because it was very hard for companies to invest the resources in bringing up production, um, manufacturing, and distribution capacity to, to do that without some sort of protection. And so patents became very important during the war, both wars. And I was interested, and, and what was also interesting was the extent to which um, the men, and it, it was men, it was all men, um, who were working in the medical field often were also involved in the military. And so there was this sort of porous boundary between being a military man and being a medical man um, that I don't think we see today. I mean, Banting himself was, was obsessed uh, with the military. And, and um, it, it's interesting when you look into biographies, it's sort of this missing piece of the, or what I think is a missing piece of the puzzle, um, and the extent to which military professionals themselves carried their own commitments and aversions to patenting within their own professionalization that I think fed into this kind of like matrix of ways of being that, that shaped um, practices at the time. And so um, there was a similar sense that patenting an invention, a military invention, an important military invention would lead to conflicts of interest. And so military men were discouraged from patenting, um, or they were discouraged from inventing um, or introducing inventions in an uncontrolled way in battle. Um, but they weren't discouraged from inventing if they followed all the appropriate procedures. Um, and there were s distinctions between the kinds of inventions that were helpful and perhaps the kinds of inventions that were more disruptive and threatening. So inventions that affected supplies were less threatening, but those that were about field techniques in the, in the heat of battle might be a bit more problematic. Um, military men themselves subscribe to a very strong ideal of the rule of law. They're, they're the ultimate boundary agents. And this is a fascinating thing about military men is I think they love the law more than lawyers do. They, 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 and this is what I found from studying General McNaughton, who um, was the head of Canada's first attempt um, through the National Research Council to create a technology transfer organization, a central one, so this type, the number one type, the independent nonprofit foundation that would manage pa patents. Um, he, and he was responsible for moving a number of medical substances from research to market. Um, and, but his, his um, I think his commitments as a military man really influenced the way he went about doing that. Um, there was a strong, um, there's a strong primacy kind of given to obedience um, within the military. And there's also the sense of, of um, if you came up with something that might help the group to give it away to, um, or to dedicate it. So this character, General Naughton, um, was responsible for developing uh, Canada's first technology transfer unit at the, at the National Research Council, and he did it by taking a number of these. So he, wasn't, he also held the National Research Council's first patent over an early system of radar. Um, he, he brought some of these ambiguities into his role in technology transfer, and many of the discussions that we see with Collip happened through officials who were also based at, at, um, at the National Research Council or the sort of nascent organizing body that helped to develop it. And so it's interesting to see how all of these different folks kind of got together and talked about it. And one of the interesting things about war is that it allowed a state of exception to uh, arise that permitted a, 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 a set, uh, it permitted experimentation that wasn't otherwise permitted, I guess, or that, um, that, wasn't, that wouldn't otherwise take place. Um, and so what you see during the war, and I won't, I'll just sort of summarize this briefly because my, my time is basically up, um, and, and we're at, we are at the end, <laughs> uh, but that there, there was a great deal of experimentation with things like pools, um, 
uh, patent custodians, patent trusteeships, where patents were held in trust and used during the war and then given back, um, holding things secret, um, using inventions boards to decide the merit of inventions, but not through the patent system, um, patent dedication, then licensing and non-exclusive. And what was interesting about McNaughton was that he really brought non-exclusive licensing into the practice that non-exclusive licensing was a core practice of the technology transfer organization at the National Research Council that was responsible for moving a lot of these medical products um, out. Um, and in part, I attribute this to, um, to some of his commitments as a military man and the experience during the wars of bringing these very complex intellectual property models into play in order to free up um, intellectual property to allow it to be produced and manufactured and distributed in, in an effective way um, during this time of crisis. So that's where I will wrap up. Um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have a fair bit of time until about 20 after the hour for questions. Um, I'll keep a, a running list if people want to raise their hands and push for more detail, questions, comments. Yes, uh, uh, you know, when you're talking about you know, Miguel saying, well, it would hurt our reputation if we apply for a patent. Um, but then at the same time, do you it wasn't assumed to hurt their reputation to hitch their way into a big pharmaceutical company. Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think in terms of the Canadian company, Iris, um, it wasn't a big company. It was, it was a very small company at that time, and it was seen as up and coming. And what, I've, what I noticed from reading through the documents that there, again, it goes back to this smaller world kind of issue um, that that there was a sense that part of the public good was about incur and I mean it's part of the sort of technology transfer matrix these days is that part of the public good is about encouraging local companies and local industry and so hitching their wagon to the pharmaceutical company this sort of small uh, homegrown I think I think it was Montreal based company was in fact not a bad thing um, and this is what I also mean about the war playing an important role in kind of changing the aversion to medical patenting or sort of it, nuancing it because I think what they realized was that um, researchers in these laboratories with limited production capacity weren't able to supply these substances in the volume that people needed them and so that was th this was the insulin experience um, and that you needed a commercial partner who was willing to invest money and resources and was able to kind of bring this to market in a, in a meaningful way and that for good or for bad the pharmaceuticals were, were that, were that, were those people. Um, but you see also a big division, I mean this is what's interesting about the McNaughton papers that I saw at the National Research Council is that you see a big division between attitudes taken, again the smaller country thing happening if an innovation came through the technology transfer unit um, and it looked like it would be good for Canadian businesses um, and perhaps there was a conflicting US patent that might block Canadian access or, or, or a, Canadian, a similar Canadian patent. So if there was a simultaneous invention and the Americans, an American patent might preempt a Canadian one. McNaughton was not above going to the patent office and telling them not to allow the US patent. <laughs> and I saw this in a number of circumstances and he was clever he didn't just say <coughs> because we need to protect local industry he would have arguments about novelty and inventiveness and you know the timing and and perhaps the Americans were going to use it for nefarious purposes that was often an argument as well that they might try and block Canadian manufacture and so it was really in Canadian interest to delay or otherwise obstruct and in a number of cases I can think of two in particular um, the patent office actually delayed the patent to the point, the US patent, to the point where it was no longer useful in Canada. So the patent would be issued five or six years after the Canadian one, and Canadian capacity had been ramped up uh, to the point where um, it was effective and covered the Canadian market, and the Americans were kind of left empty handed. So it's a different, it was a really different world. I mean, he had a personal phone line to the patent office, and because he was a decorated general, I mean, this guy, you have to understand how, what a super, what a, he was like that, who's that guy who went to the moon? 
Yeah, no, the Canadian one with the guitar. That's Chris Hatfield. Chris Hatfield, yeah. Did he go to the moon? No. I can't remember. No. no. Space station? <laughs> Space station guy. Space station guy. <laughs> Anyways, the guy with the guitar, I wasn't following this, I was having a baby at the time, but like he, he, you know, he was playing the guitar, he was like that, I mean, this, and he, he wasn't that, he wasn't as good with people, um, but he was, um, he was a bit of a, he was, he was a celebrity, and so he made things happen, and so he used his, his personal, a bit of his, his persona to, to kind of make things happen. Um, oh, idea. Um, so thank you very much. That was a fantastic history lesson on, on patents and medicine. And for myself, it's, uh, it's interesting because I've uh, practiced for now quite some time in basic sciences research and uh, recently made the transition to uh, medicine. So um, I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of, you talked a little bit about it, about how we've come to a place that's very different from what history uh, historically was the case. So. Um, what are your thoughts on about where we're at today and maybe how we can move back towards um, sort of a more humanist approach to that? Hmm. I mean, I'm interested. So you were, you were in science and now you're in medicine? Is that what you said? Still, still an avid researcher, but yeah, also kind of medical school here right now. And, and so I'm interested in what your observations were in kind of your... I mean, did you encounter patenting? Did you... Certainly, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, the research environment that you described is very different from what it is today. Um, mm -hmm. So today, getting funding is it's very difficult. So uh, I th in, my, in my opinion, uh, pursuing intellectual property is, is sort of very important for researchers who are developing anything that could be patented mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to provide funding to support the research. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the sort of, I mean, I, I don't, part of me, it's a big issue. <laughs> it's a big issue, and all I can say is that what I find uh, sort of heartwarming about some of the, the archival work is the extent to which it was such a personal, person-to-person -person kind of culture um, of patenting. Um, universities hadn't, um, I, I feel like some of, the, um, some of the institutional or administrative mechanisms that exist now in universities and some of the assumptions about the benefit of patents and the need for patents and the sort of number crunching. I mean, there was no real sense back then that you counted the number of patents that a university might have, that people were given some latitude to explore what their commitments were and then to express it in a legal solution. I mean, that, that's what I find interesting about Collip's position was that he kind of said, well, you know, this is who I am. This makes me feel good. This, this works for me. And he did this for two, for two innovations, right? Um, he said, this works for me. This, I, can, I can do this. Um, it makes me able to talk to my colleagues. Uh, but different world, right? He wasn't getting any, you know, there was no sense from the university that he had to patent. And it's a very different world in that sense. I don't know if patents are good or bad or ugly. I think some, you know, it's a, that's a big issue. There's a, there's a certain necessity. Um, and particularly if you're pursuing a certain kind of research to get a patent in a certain area. But I think when the focus becomes on the commodification before it becomes on the sort of like the, the more inspiring aspects of science and research, um, then that's a problem. And the extent to which the universities run on their own sort of institutional logic to kind of like, to kind of get to that end, it's, it's like universities and, and I love technology transfer offices, so it's not actually a critique of technology transfer, it's also um, the, um, the extent to which pr research, like tenure and promotion are based on, on you know, acc accruing these kinds of numbers and results and the extent to which all of these, these things that we're involved with have, these, have various, you know, various um, counters and uh, I don't know, it's, it's a bigger cultural change. Ultimately, I think it comes from the individual and I, I, I really think that if you have a perspective and you want to express it, um, you should and it's amazing even though this was a smaller world, um, I think that I believe in the power of the individual to create um, to create inspiring solutions like personal solutions that can then influence other people or create novel um, mechanisms that then radiate out. So if you feel a certain way about something, I think you should act on it legally and create your own sort of informal normativity, regardless of whether it matches the law. <laughs> on the books. <laughs> Yeah, as usual, great presentation, really interesting. 
I, just before I get to my question, I should say that he looks a lot like Chris Hadfield, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, that's, I think, why it came that's, to mind, right? right? The, more me, less charismatic. But, <laughs> I think it was the, the style of photograph taking at the yeah. time, right? Yeah, I don't if you imagine him. Like, tweeting, though, I just can't see him tweeting. So <laughs> he was a real early adopter, I have right. to say. I mean, right. this guy, he invented radar before most people had oh, great. So, yeah, so he's another interviewer. <laughs> Um, I've got a question for you uh, concerning some of the, the early professionalization that we identified in the British medical patenting context. Um, because like you, uh, I spent some time in Britain, and one of the things that always struck me about English society is the distinct sense of class there as compared to, say, the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that some of the, the elements of those professionalization norms that you identified, like that it's unseemly for mm -hmm. doctors to be pursuing, you know, uh, inventions for medicine, for, sorry, for, for money and for profit, that sort of thing. It sounds a lot like some of the early gentlemanly and upper class norms that say govern the early uh, lawyerly profession. The barristers were not to be accepting sums. They're you know, too proud to yes. turn to take money. Yeah. So I was wondering if you found that how much of those professionalization norms were influenced by, say, class? Mm -hmm. And if you found something different between the British case studies and the Canadian case studies in that sense. My hypothesis being there's less sense of class in Canada than I could be in, in Taiwan. That's interesting. I mean, there were fewer people in Canada, so there, there was, and the people who did get involved in research tended to come from a certain class often, but not necessarily. I, it's, I mean, what was interesting in the UK was the extent to which the British Medical Association, and again, I'm no historian of like the sort of medical historian, but my sense from reading the materials was that the British Medical Association was kind of about raising the class of the lowest, the lowest rung of the ladder, um, and that the more elite medical practitioners maintained their own separate organizations. Um, and, the, and so when I looked f at the Royal Society, <laughs> Um, the, the, that represented uh, surgeons, for example, they didn't have similar, they didn't, they didn't pass a similar resolution, right? Um, so this resolution was just formally passed on the books at the British Medical Association, but the other more elite um, bodies that represented specialties um, didn't pass a similar resolution. And I don't know if that means that the British Medical Association was intended to sort of take the field, or if they disagreed or felt that it was unnecessary because they just weren't getting their hands dirty that way, or if they felt like they, they kind of, yeah, they, that they were above reproach in some way. So I think, I mean, it's a great observation. I haven't, got a, I haven't got a great answer to it in the UK situation. Now, if you're looking at it in relation to Canada um, and the extent to which it played out differently here, it's hard to say. I don't, I, I don't think I know enough about the sort of um, the identity of can early Canadian medical practitioners to kind of understand um, like the role that class would have played in that. I, yeah. And their bodies were much less developed and the documentation is less as well from that period. So it's, it's hard to, it was hard for me to get a, a sense. I did get the sense that they were looking at, they were reading US, UK materials and, and importing them. And another project that I'm doing actually is looking at the, what I call like the missing Canadian patent libraries. So there were all these um, libraries of how-to manuals, of how to get patents and, and hold patents and do all these things that existed in these private collections in Canada that have all been dispersed, but it was, it was an immense source of, like, of transnational know-how that was kind of making its way um, uh, like across the borders, but it's, we don't know, we don't know how, these knowledge, how this knowledge flowed exactly. So I, I'm trying to understand that a bit better. It's an ongoing project. Another question? Okay, just more, it's a bit of a comment and a specific question. This yeah. is the first question on, on academic research. I'm not a researcher, not, I'm mm -hmm. not a lawyer or anything. Um, but just as, as feedback, so a lot of times I get, when I listen to your talk, you know, when you listen to things, sometimes patents, chilling research, or that profit um, and is not curiosity-driven research, mm -hmm. that, um, at least from, a lot of times I get assigned a negative touch. Um, it's, um, you're not working to do good if you're working for profit, mm -hmm. and um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are in uh, pharmaceutical research, and uh, I can only speak for them. That's just not the case. And 
my wife worked for the Biotechnology Association around Basel, uh, Strasbourg, and, and Freiburg. And so she met with all kinds of companies. And the amount of curiosity-driven research um, is incredible. So just mm -hmm. that feeling that researchers sometimes get that if we do something that's applicable, then you get put down. I don't know, Absolutely. It's just, um, it's just a feeling. And my specific question is, if you go outside of health research, so if you look at another fast technology, fast growing technology industry, such as semiconductors or whatever, is, is there evidence or is there a suggestion that they would be faster if we, could, in, in medical research, uh, often you say, we're all working together, we're somewhat mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. But would Moore's Law really be faster if everybody was working together to make semiconductors that will um, even faster than they are? And instead of having this uh, culture of secrecy, and privacy, and patenting. I just, I just want yeah. to, it's an assumption. We all think it would be better, but is it really better? Mm -hmm. And some of the companies my wife worked with, they were working on a problem, because another problem was blocked by a patent. Mm -hmm. So it was blocked by a patent, that's true. But they yeah. found another, a solution to another problem, and they worked on that, that might not have been addressed. So, so somehow things yeah, I, I, I don't know anything specifically that addresses that, but what I would say is what you're reflecting is, is what I saw in the, in the 1920s, 1930s Medical Research Council documents, that the sense of moving from away from this idea that patents were inherently evil or uh, destructive of, of research interest and curiosity to this idea that patents actually were extremely helpful. Um, and patents were extremely helpful in creating goals for people, in mobilizing people, in, mo in, in allowing access to stable resources. Because the reality is everybody has to put bread on the table, and so you need a source of funding that's going to be secure and stable to allow you to conduct your research. So I, I hope you didn't get the impression from the talk that I, that I felt this way, because I actually feel I'm, I'm, I'm a little ambivalent. Like the, these are the, the arguments that arise. Um, I think that in many cases, patents are the best solution, the best way forward, or the best solution that we have. Um, and that, uh, and that um, in, in many cases, um, that people pursue their research with, you know, with what's inside them, with, with their particular sets of commitments. Um, and, and that um, they can have a commitment to doing groundbreaking um, interest, uh, research for the public good, like Collip did, for example, but they could also be interested in having an, uh, a comfortable life or a not, um, not below the poverty line life, like Collip did as well, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> in fact, I think that that is you know, a well-fed researcher is a researcher you know who will um, who will succeed. <laughs> so um, I, I I don't I don't think that people in a particular sector or industry necessarily have a particular um, you know are just there sort of for a particular cutthroat kind of reasons. I think it's very complicated, and everybody's got their own story about it. So yeah, I, I, as to the c collaborative question, or if you know, if we open up every field, I, I I don't know. I think it really differs on the particular innovation um, and who has expertise in a particular area, and the extent to which working together they might uh, come up with something better. When is it too many cooks? Um, when are we sharing stuff? When are we just making a mess? I don't know. Um, I think you have to look at every particular situation on its own. But yeah, thanks. Okay, so complexity. Yeah. <laughs> to conclude on, before I thank Tina for her presentation today, I just want to remind folks uh, in the room about the, the last um, installation of this year's seminar series will be on Friday, March 11th, um, and it's entitled Marketing Restrictions on Tobacco and Alcohol Products, International Human Rights and Comparative Law Perspectives. It will be delivered by Oscar Cabrera, who's visiting us from Georgetown University. That's on March 11th. So Tina, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. You've complicated these arguments, which we see time and again, not just 100 years ago, but I can think of headlines this week around you know, the gene editing technology, CRISPR, some folks might be paying attention to that there's a billion dollar court battle under, underway right now. Exactly these kinds of debates are, are, are arguments being raised without that much attention to the people, the institutions, and interests behind them. So I really appreciate Tina's wonderful presentation for sort of drawing our attention to those complexities 
and, and the importance of sort of delving into them to really make sense of um, the good and the bad of the patent. So thank you very much. I hope you all join me in thanking Tina as well.